Good afternoon and welcome um, uh, to today's Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus. Uh, the briefing today is on the treatment of depression, what works, when, and why. Uh, I'm Joan Goldberg, Executive Director of the American Society for Cell Biology. I want to thank the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus, the CDRC, which is co-chaired by Representative Brian Bilbray, Representative Mike Castle, Representative Jackie Spear, and Representative Rush Holt. Um, I want to thank them and their staff, in particular for their commitment to the advancement of biological research and their ongoing support for this caucus. I also want to thank the Howard Hughes National Institute for its support of these briefings through a generous grant to, to the Coalition for the Life Sciences. And the Coalition for the Life Sciences, lastly, I want to acknowledge because that group also helps make this uh, series of briefings possible. The CLS members include the American Society for Cell Biology, which is why I'm here. The uh, American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, the Genetic Society of America, Howard Hughes, and the Society for Neuroscience. I also want to note that these briefings are videotaped. Um, if you'd like to locate past briefings or this one in the future, you can go to the CLS website at www.coalitionforlifesciences.org. You can also register for the RSS feed so that you can learn when there's a new briefing available. Now, to the matter at hand, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert DeRubis. Um, he is the Samuel H. Preston Term Professor in the Social Sciences and Professor of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. He's been a member of the faculty there since 1983. He has authored and co-authored nearly 100 articles and book chapters on the treatment of depression. His empirical research comparing the benefits of cognitive therapy and medication for severe depression have been published in many prestigious journals um, many of you may be aware of his most recent article in January, which was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It got a fair amount of press attention. Uh, in that article, he reports on a meta-analysis of research regarding the efficacy of antidepressants relative to placebos for patients suffering from mild and moderate and severe depression. His research also focuses on the processes that cause and maintain these disorders, as well as treatment processes that reduce and prevent the return of symptoms. He and his students have used the gold standard of randomized uh, clinical trials that compare the effects of antidepressants to that of cognitive therapy. Other areas of, of research interest include testing hypotheses about predicting response to treatment and resistance to relapse, and the process by which cognitive therapy achieves its effects. I'm pleased to, protect, to present uh, Dr. Rubis to you today, and I know he'll be happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joan, and thank you all for the opportunity to talk about some work that's very important to me and to my colleagues, and I think uh, to people suffering from depression and, and families uh, who, who uh, bear that part of that burden, a good part of that burden. So uh, I won't say too much by way of background, but it, I think I do need to, to set up uh, any discussion of depression. And, and uh, uh, we need to talk about depression as a disorder of mind and brain. Uh, the lifetime prevalence of major depressive disorder uh, is about 15% in this country, uh, tw twice as common in women. Uh, the estimated annual workplace losses in the US alone is about $50 billion. Uh, and uh, this is a loss of productivity, lo uh, uh, sick time, and so on. Uh, the substantial contributors, and there are many, it's a complicated disorder, but uh, this, the big ones are uh, uh, stressful life events. Uh, I didn't put in there early uh, uh, traumatic events, but those, those certainly play in as well. The stressful life events uh, in regard to uh, onsets. Uh, there is heritable genetic risk, though it's not high, but it's there. Uh, and then, uh, most recently, there's been quite a lot of excitement uh, and some controversy about uh, hypotheses that uh, test interaction uh, effects of uh, specific genes and, uh, uh, and environmental uh, influences. Interactions meaning, of course, that the, uh, those uh, with the gene at risk uh, would only likely come to have depression if they also have on top of that stressful life events. So that's the interaction idea that it's like you have to have both. Uh, the genetic and environmental effects each impair the structure and function of uh, crucial areas in the brain. And uh, I didn't mention the neurotransmitters here. I'll make reference to some of those later. But the, uh, the, uh, when I say the, the, the uh, 
function of these areas. I'm referencing uh, uh, really the, the, way, the ways in which the neurotransmitters are synthesized, uh, blocked, and so on. But also there are, uh, 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 there's evidence that uh, there are structural issues, brain structure issues that uh, get involved in depression. And the two um, areas that uh, are, are, are main focus in depression are, and these are large areas, but uh, the primitive or limbic brain, the amygdala has uh, uh, been uh, specifically targeted as a place that uh, when uh, uh, especially active supports uh, uh, too much emotion, if you will, or an over generation of emotion. Uh, but it's all these, these areas, of course, as many of you know, are, are responsible for the basic drives, which are involved uh, quite heavily in depression, uh, sex drives, uh, appetite, and so on. These things are all affected in depression, and those are all uh, supported by those brain structures. Uh, and then, of course, there's the neocortex, the part that uh, uh, gets us um, thinking about things and uh, worrying about things and uh, focusing on things. And uh, we're talking about prefrontal uh, lobes. Uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has been a focus of in inquiry in regard to depression. And these are uh, structures that support executive functions, including, uh, and this is the important thing, including the executive functions that regulate our emotions. So if you think of, uh, it's uh, quite simplified, but if you think of emotions as happening when they're generated and not regulated, uh, then uh, you get the picture that there uh, is a system here that we need to understand and that treatments might need to uh, address. Um, this is a, a quote of someone who was profoundly depressed. Um, one or more of you may recognize this quote. I'm now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on earth. Does anyone know who said this? Abraham Lincoln. Correct. Give this man an extra lunch or something. Uh, <laughs> yes. Abraham Lincoln. So Lincoln, uh, as I'm not a, a, a historian, but uh, I, my impression is that he was not prone to uh, exaggeration uh, generally. And so this was his experience, at least during the, the time when he was depressed. And uh, if you read that over and over again, uh, you, you should stop and because uh, uh, it could get you quite depressed, I think. It does to me. Um, so um, I just want to review uh, first the, uh, what we know about the evidence-based somatic treatments for depression. I say somatic because the first one I'm going to talk about is one that's not talked about a lot, but it's the most effective one we have, and that is electroconvulsive therapy. Um, but it's also the least widely used of those that I'll, I'll talk about today. And in fact, I won't reference it again, but I thought it, it should be mentioned. Uh, the cost of it is high. Uh, people have a I guess, understandable aversion to the procedure itself. Um, and there are some uh, issues about the effects on memory. Uh, that's, that's a complicated matter, but, but at the very least, there are some short-term effects that uh, this procedure has on memory. And so it makes it, uh, uh, again, it's another reason why it's not used so much. Uh, antidepressant medications. Uh, I'll just quickly go through the history there. They introduced in the 1950s with the MAOIs. Uh, those are the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. The first of those was uh, got to have the brand name Nardil. If it's got a capital letter, that's a brand name. If it's uh, small, it's the uh, chemical name. So Nardil was first introduced in the 50s. Uh, most recently, these drugs have come back uh, in the form of a patch, transdermal patch, uh, sledgling. Just an example of that. Um, uh, in the 60s, the tricyclic antidepressants came into uh, to play. Uh, the, the imipramine was probably as uh, widely used as any of them. Elevil, you might have heard of. It's a particularly good name with a capital E. Um, and, and then uh, the 1980s came the surge of the use of antidepressant medications. And it came from the uh, uh, introduction of the SSRIs, that's the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, uh, two that you might have or probably would have heard of, certainly would be Prozac and Paxil. And um, when you look at the CDC uh, studies, the use of, of medications in our country, and the most recent uh, 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 evidence uh, that they gathered was that the antidepressants are the most widely used class of medications in our, uh, most widely prescribed in our country. And again, uh, this happened, this has been burgeoning since the 1980s, and it happened um, because the uh, SSRIs, uh, well, I guess I'll, uh, uh, talk about that in a minute, but they, they were much easier to prescribe and to take uh, in a variety of ways. Um, and then now, we're going to come a bit full circle. The tricyclics were actually non-selective reuptake inhibitors, but 
that was thought to be a bad thing, which is why selectivity became a good thing. And then now the newest uh, medications are the NSRIs, the non-selective reuptake inhibitors. They share with the uh, SSRIs uh, a lower, uh, a different side effect profile uh, than the tricyclics, and so they're favored. But uh, w w when, uh, so what, what's going on besides serotonin? Norepinephrine is the main other uh, neurotransmitter that is targeted or believed to be targeted by these medications. Dopamine is being talked about quite a lot, though, too, and others. Um, so the principal differences between these uh, four classes of medicines is in their tolerability, uh, the nature and severity of their side effects, um, and then this is the big one, uh, suicide risk potential. There's been a lot of talk about the promoting of suicidal thinking of SSRIs. I'm, I, I've read that literature quite a bit, and I, I, I certainly wouldn't uh, want anyone to think, uh, I, I myself don't think that there's uh, good strong evidence uh, that there is uh, that, that they do more to promote suicidal thinking than they do to reduce it. Uh, so, uh, but, so that's not what I'm re referencing here. I'm talking about the fact that some of the older medicines, the tricyclics, could actually be used in the implementation of suicide. So giving uh, depressed people medicines that they could then use uh, uh, for suicide was, was of course, a, uh, not a good thing. And the SSRIs have the property that it's much harder to commit suicide uh, with them. Um, and they all produce, uh, on average, about 20 to 30 percent increment in response rates. There are many ways to talk about the outcomes here. Um, and this, when I say increments, I mean, oops, I mean relative to uh, uh, pill placebo. So uh, typical finding, or if you look across findings, it's uh, about 60 percent of people respond to uh, whatever medicine, and about 35 percent respond to whatever placebo was uh, compared to it. And again, the, the results vary a bit. Yes? Well, uh, you said the Yes. 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 Uh, more than sixty percent. Mm -hmm. and, and moreover, uh, it's it's been tested and used only with the most severe cases, and so getting response. So there, again, there are many ways to measure uh, the effects of treatment. To get response, you have to get it down, uh, symptoms down to a low enough level. It's not just how much it's reduced; it's how, how where they are at the end. And yes, but even in even using that criterion, uh, there it's a bit better. Okay, then there are evidence-based psychological treatments for depression. These are things that fewer people know about, certainly, than the medicines. They've been far less widely researched. Uh, uh, there, there, there is no, uh, uh, there's no uh, uh, capital that's involved in them. There's no, uh, uh, there's no interest that's uh, advanced uh, uh, by them other than the prof professions of individuals. And um, so, uh, and maybe booksellers. Uh, and so cognitive therapy um, is the most extensively researched of them. And I, I say the most widely practiced. That doesn't mean it is widely practiced. And we don't even know how widely practiced it is because it's hard to measure uh, whether someone's doing it, or at least uh, we know how to measure it, but it's hard to get those measurements out into the world. Uh, uh, tests of it uh, uh, show that it compares favorably in its effects with antidepressant medications. And this is the part that uh, most people just don't believe, or many people just don't believe. But the, the, the evidence, I'll show you some of it in a minute, the evidence is there that uh, even in more severe cases, um, does that sound better? Sounds better to me, uh, if I'm away from this microphone. Yes, good. Um, so uh, uh, compares favorably even in more severe cases. And it's the only treatment, and I mean that, the only treatment, uh, with substantial evidence of relapse prevention. That is, a treatment that when you give it, uh, you can see the effects after it stops. Uh, uh, not uh, that you don't have to keep taking the treatment to, in order to prevent relapse. So um, there's another form of therapy that's been researched and has fared well as an acute treatment or short-term treatment in clinical trials, uh, but uh, has a slower onset of uh, effect, uh, it seems, best evidence uh, of, uh, relative to antidepressant medicines or cognitive therapy. Uh, it's been shown, it's been worked on mainly uh, beyond uh, the tr acute treatment as a maintenance treatment, that is, as a treatment that you keep on giving. Uh, people come back and it helps keep the depression is at bay, but again, not as a prevention treatment. And then uh, it's readily accepted uh, by clinicians who trained psychodynamically. A lot, a lot of clinicians don't like the cognitive therapy, just what it is, and so uh, this is a treatment that's um, uh, more uh, to their liking. Uh, behavioral activation is a new one. Uh, probably very few of you would have heard of it, but it's, a, it's meant to be a stripped down bare bones uh, uh, therapy that um, uh, has been tested a couple of times. I say conducted, both uh, clinical trials were conducted in Seattle just to, to give you a sense of how little, uh, you know, how tough it is to get this kind of research done. Uh, it's, ex it's expensive research and uh, the NIMH does, it has in the past at any rate funded it. 
Um, uh, but uh, it's very hard to get lots and lots of evidence for these things. But it's very intriguing to me because uh, it may, but we don't know, be better suited for dissemination than either of these. And dissemination is a big thing. Uh, we know how to disseminate antidepressant medications, kind of. We're not so sure we know how to disseminate the expert giving of those, but at least we know the pharmacies are out there. But uh, we don't. Uh, uh, we're, we do worry about the dissemination of, of these treatments, and, and there's been some worry that this one might be uh, too complicated uh, 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 for uh, widespread dissemination. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but it uh, would be, be great to test that. But when it's used well, it does well. Um, this is a paper, this, well, this is an, uh, I've tacked some data onto a paper we published uh, uh, a decade ago now. And, um, uh, the question was, uh, uh, the idea that was out there was that uh, for people with more severely de uh, depressed symptoms or people who are depressed with the, on the more severe range, the belief was, and there was some evidence, and here's one piece of evidence, that uh, medicines were simply better than cognitive therapy, which prior to this study was uh, 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 looking pretty good. Well, uh, um, let me just tell you that more is worse, and so these are end of treatment scores, cognitive therapy up here. Uh, the antidepressant medication mipramine here, and it got a lot of people to say, well, gee, uh, for more severe patients, you just better give the medicines because it's better. Well, it turns out there were other uh, data around. We dug around and got them uh, uh, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, and uh, you can see there was a study in which that had some data, relevant data. The, the answer is flipped. Let me get to the bottom line. Um, the, uh, when we published the paper, basically uh, pick them, choose them between cognitive therapy and medications for these more severely depressed patients. Uh, for this last one, uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, this is our own study. For this last set of bars, I, I've pulled all the data. And this is all the data there are and were. Uh, and uh, uh, you see that there's basically uh, uh, no difference in uh, if the effects of these two treatments for the more severely depressed patients. Again, not something that uh, is always believed when it's read. Um, this is, these are data of our own uh, from uh, reasonably large scale, at least in our field, uh, clinical trial. Let me walk you through what this is. These uh, uh, back here are all the patients who responded to either medications or cognitive therapy uh, in, our, in our trial that uh, I referenced uh, in a flash a minute ago. Um, so all of these patients are doing well at the beginning of a year. And the question is, do they make it to the end of the year without ticking down? A, a, a tick down means that uh, a patient relapsed in that group. And so you tick down until you get to the percentage who, it's called a survival analysis, but uh, uh, it means surviving without, in this case, surviving without a relapse during the year. So what are, these, what are these graphs showing? Well, what this shows is what happened to those patients who were, went on to placebo after they were, got well on the medication. And you can see that uh, through backwards inference, they needed the medications, uh, that most of them did relapse. These are patients who remained on their medications throughout the year, uh, and they did better. Uh, and then these are patients who had had uh, uh, cognitive therapy uh, and then had three sessions of therapy, uh, no more than that, during the year. And you can see that they retained uh, their gains. And just to tell you that the, the response rate that got them here was identical between the medicines and the cognitive therapy. That's why we can start with 100. I could start it up here at 58 if we want. We could show the same graph. But the point is you get the same kinds of differences, the same kind of retention of gains here, some retention of gains here, but by staying on the medicine. And then, of course, the, the, that, that's the at least retention of gains uh, when a person goes off the medicine. Um, this is just another way of looking at those data. It's also a way to tell you that we're, we've got a long way to go. Um, if we talk about sustained improvement through 16 months, sustained improvement means a person started treatment, stayed in treatment, got well, and stayed well through 16 months. You can see that for those patients who are on medications for four months and placebo for the following 12, one in seven had the evidence to sustain improvement. For those who stayed on their got on medications and stayed on the entire time, three out of 10, and those who got cognitive therapy and uh, then had a few boosters, what we call booster sessions in the following year, uh, they uh, had a 40% sustained improvement. Not great, but it's the best uh, that we uh, uh, know how to do, we think, uh, except maybe ECT, but ECT has this problem, that it, there's, the relapse is, is very high from C ECT if you, if you stop it. All right, um, the thing that pops into many people's minds when they see these kinds of uh, results is, yeah, but uh, are, isn't therapy so very expensive? And in fact, uh, our, uh, kind of a crude analysis that we did, I'd love to do a better one, uh, suggests that it's in fact not uh, more expensive. This is the cumulative costs of, of cognitive therapy uh, as we delivered it in our trial. Uh, over time, you can see that the costs are higher than the medicines during the trial because 
uh, uh, for the reasons that you can imagine. But then we, we stop the cognitive therapy pretty much. That's the three sessions just piling up a little bit, uh, bit by bit over the year, but the medicines stay on. And so the, medicine, the, the, the lines cross. So it's, it's, it's a myth that uh, uh, therapy is too expensive for our society to fund if you, be, you, know, if you believe uh, the data, the findings in particular uh, of the kind that I've shown you. Now, uh, there's a, a term that's being used a lot now, personalized medicine. Uh, we didn't know we've been studying personalized medicine for a couple of decades, but I think we have. Um, and the question, and, and, and this, it's very easy to get confused about personalized medicine, I think. Um, the real question isn't for whom isn't just, for whom does a given treatment do better, this kind of person or that kind of person, because that's, it's not clear where you go next. You might, what, you're going to withhold it from the person who, for whom it's not good? I'm not so sure. It depends on a lot of other factors. But the real important question is when there's more than one treatment that, that isn't shown to be good in some way, uh, given a person's particular characteristics, which is the best treatment for that person? So, so I just put it personally for us. Which is, uh, treatment is most likely to work for me? Which is most likely to work for you? Okay, so the, the clues that we go looking for regard symptom patterns, demographics, comorbidities, that just means other uh, psychiatric uh, illnesses that uh, coexist with the depression. That's very common for that to happen. Uh, there's a lot of interest now in genes for this. Uh, uh, very little, if any, findings uh, uh, that are even promising at this point, but it's certainly where, we're, where people will be looking, will be looking. And then uh, there's neuroimaging uh, as a tool for De determining characteristics of individuals that might point them to one treatment or another. Um, this is the paper uh, that Joan referenced. Uh, this isn't the paper, but this is uh, the main uh, 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 finding from the paper where we looked at the effects of antidepressant medications. Um, I, I'm not going to go into all of the methodology. I'm happy to defend every bit of it, but uh, uh, that would take quite a bit of time and anticipation, so I'll wait for questions on that. But what this shows, so let me, let me walk you through this. So, uh, what we have here along here is sub degree of severity of depressive symptoms at the time the person started a clinical trial that compared an antidepressant to a placebo. Okay, so it ranged from relatively low, trust me, to extremely high. And then we had 718 patients uh, included in this uh, mega-analysis or meta-analysis. And um, what, we, what we looked at was how much change did, the, did these patients evidence over the course of treatment if they were in the placebo group, that would be in the blue, or if they were in the, one of the medicine groups, that would be in the red. And as you can see, at the higher end here, the, the advantage of the uh, uh, medicine is quite, quite substantial relative to the placebo. But as you go down the severity scale, the advantage gets less and less and less. Uh, I don't know that uh, this is model data, so I, I wouldn't trust the fact that the lines slip, although there are some reasons to, to think that that could be real. Uh, we need to study that more. But what, what's more important is that the, the lines converge. And it, it begins to tell us that in this region, which is where most depressed patients live, uh, most depressed patients who come in for treatment are in, in this region. Uh, at least our data, and they're the only data of their kind out there, and we'd love to see more, our data would suggest that there isn't a clear advantage of the medications uh, that exceeds that which you get from uh, placebo treatment. And again, we talk about the implications of that, which are uh, subtle and uh, certainly not, uh, uh, at least not simple. Um, so here's, so that's in a way personalized medicine. It's thinking, well, well uh, now that's the wrong kind of question, for whom are medications good? But there is a utility in that, in that with the medicines being prescribed at the highest rate of any medicine in the country right now, it would be good for us to take stock as to whether there are subgroups who perhaps uh, uh, it should be reconsidered as whether they should be started on medicines right away and so on, or whether there are alternatives. So we're back to some data from our, our research. And um, this is just, again, uh, our study that we published a few years ago. Uh, I mentioned to you that 58% responded to treatment in both the medicine group and the cognitive therapy group. So that's, that's the 58 there. That means that 42% dropped out or didn't respond in each group. Now, the reason I put it this way is because now we have these treatments that are equal uh, in, 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 here in this data set. And now the question is, are, is it the same people who respond to these two treatments? Or can we identify subgroups uh, for whom uh, this treatment's a better idea and other subgroups for whom this treatment's a better idea? And let me show you just some examples of what we've done here. The, the red doesn't show up so well, so I'm going to have to point this out. This was a paper uh, we published a, f a couple of years back, um, and this shows uh, 
uh, again, more is worse. And what this shows is for patients who, who were assigned to antidepressant medications who reported to us when they entered the clinic that they'd already had two or more treatments with antidepressants sometime in their life, uh, their treatment response was quite poor. That, that's a not a very good ending score. And you say, well, those are people who are especially sick, they're hard to treat, and so on. Well, this is a, an experiment randomized. So the other people randomized to, to this treatment, cognitive therapy, also two or more prior treatments, those, those people did reasonably well. And that, that difference is uh, significant for what that's worth. But at any rate, uh, certainly a difference there, a difference one would care about. And then you see in the other, on the other bars, there really aren't uh, differences, although uh, uh, the um, uh, medicines, uh, uh, just visually, if you look, the medicines did quite well for that group of patients who uh, had never seen a medicine before. And so there, there are some very interesting implications of that. My colleague Jay Amsterdam in the Depression Research Unit at Penn has written quite extensively on uh, the phenomenon that he thinks might uh, uh, account for this, uh, for, well, for the difference between this and this, difference between patients who are treatment naive, getting well, patients who are getting more treatments, have had several treatments not benefiting so much. Um, employment status. Why employment status? Well, it's, this would not seem like a very scientific uh, kind of thing to go after, uh, uh, but it's a demographic that turned out to make quite a lot of difference. Uh, and in particular, there, yeah. So it turns out that if you were unemployed, you were, uh, uh, you, you, it was a better idea for you to be assigned to the cognitive therapy condition of our study than to the medication condition. That's a rather poor outcome for those patients, not a big sample size. But uh, the cognitive therapy patients did well. We looked, um, we had colleagues in England who were setting up uh, and working with Gordon Brown on some issues to do with the changing their healthcare system, and uh, in particular in regard to mental health. And so the, we told them we had some data around on what happened to employment during our trial. And we were quite surprised when we looked uh, carefully at it. Um, these are data we shipped over there a couple of years ago. We still have, haven't published on them, but um, uh, we, we want to be really clear of the meaning of them and look at, at, at the follow-up as well. But these are patients who are on medications, uh, who receive medications for 16 weeks. This is the uh, percent of those patients whose roughly, uh, whose, whose employment status deteriorated. One example of that being they went from employed fully to employed part-time or to unemployed. Um, these are patients whose employment status improved. And then a very simple metric, uh, it's not necessarily the best one, is what's the difference between those? How many, what, how many more, as it were, improved than deteriorated? Here, here's what happened in cognitive therapy. The percent who deteriorated was uh, quite small. The percent that improved was quite uh, large, about 23% uh, difference here. So um, it, it gives us a clue about why it's a good idea to get a certain kind of treatment if you have a certain kind of problem. The, the, in, in cognitive therapy, one of the things one works on is, is activating the person, getting them beyond barriers, and so on. Medications can help with that, uh, uh, but uh, since that's sort of built into the cognitive therapy treatment, it's not shocking that we get, got this result. It was just surprising that it occurred in a 16-week span. Um, this is one that went uh, uh, surprisingly in the other direction, starts to get us thinking about the brain again, uh, and that is uh, if you look, let's see, do I have, yeah. So uh, these are people with personality disorders. They were randomly assigned, again, same study, to either get cognitive therapy or antidepressant medications. I'm sorry, and in this one, uh, maybe it was true before, but more is better. Uh, so these are response rates. So uh, uh, very good response rates for people with personality disorders. These are people who are thought to be difficult, difficult to treat. And in fact, they are difficult to treat for cognitive therapy. The important piece of information here, and it begins to tell us something about what these medicines might be doing, that they would affect this broader uh, problem that we refer to as personality disorder. And in fact, it, it's almost uh, humorous, at least for an insider, to, to see that uh, these are people without personality disorders. You might think of them as pure depressions. This is what the antidepressant did. Didn't quite reach 50% response. This is what the cognitive therapy did, uh, reached 70% uh, for those with pure depression. So we have two depression treatments here, but one of them seems to work especially well if there are these other problems that, that cognitive therapy, at least in the short run, has trouble dealing with. So um, I'm going to uh, see if, uh, have you do a little eye tracking here. This is the result uh, that we got from a subset of patients who had particularly poor emotion regulation. So these are patients who are histrionic, who are rather easily riled, who are getting angry a lot, and, and, and that's a part of their depression or contributes to their depression. And what you see here is that if they got antidepressant medication, surprisingly, they did quite well. If they got cognitive therapy, not so well. Um, oh, and then, yes. 
So this is, this is all the patients with personality disorders. And this just shows something interesting. It shows nothing simple. And that is, I've already told you that the cognitive therapy patients didn't do so well if they were assigned to cognitive, uh, the, I'm sorry, the personality disorder patients didn't do so well if they were assigned to cognitive therapy. But look what happened if they happened to get better. They stayed better. So something happened in that treatment that was very, very helpful, but it was hard to get very many of them to that point. On the other hand, the antidepressant medications got quite a few more to that level, and, and you can then tell that the medicines were needed because look what happens to the patients who are then put on placebo from that group. Almost none of them uh, resisted relapse during the uh, following year. Those who stayed on the medicines did pretty well. They ended up uh, uh, keeping most of the gains, or most of them uh, uh, continued to do well. So uh, this is something, I, I'm, I'm not a good time watcher. How much time do I have? Okay, so this is just a little something to show you of what, you, what we can do with, in our lab with, with, uh, once we have these kinds of data to try to dig down into how these treatments work and, and what we might be able someday to bring to the clinic. So one question we have, and it's, and it's a, a, one of a long list of, of these kinds of questions, but can we test patients following successful treatment to determine if they're ready to resist relapse? I wish I had brought with me a medical example of some kind of medical test that you could give after someone looks like they're doing well that would tell you that they're not going to get, uh, uh, they're not going to have the uh, trouble recur. But you can all make up your own example, and you can imagine what the effort involves. And this is simply, uh, we, we developed uh, a me two measures of uh, what uh, cognitive therapy uh, performance and skills. So we have, we were able to watch uh, uh, videotape sessions of therapy and, and watch as the patient explains what they did during the week to help themselves. So we can code these things. We have coders who can do this. And then we also have a, a kind of like an, a final exam where we ask the patient to write down what they would do if certain things happened to them. And we have a uh, grading of those. And when we put those two things together, what you see here, and I, I shouldn't have this Biddle group. This is just uh, full disclosure. There are a few people who we, we don't know what happened to them. But these people we know ha what happened to them is that they, uh, they get, these are the people who got well and stayed well for 12 months. These are the people who stayed well, were doing well by all measures. Their depression was down, they looked very good, but they relapsed during the follow-up period. Well, this is how they did on the, these two tests, if you will. This is the average for that group who relapsed. So it's like a crystal ball, right? Because these, these measures are taken before any of the relapsing happened or didn't happen. And this is the average for the patients who uh, 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 were, were set to do well during the next 12 months. And you can see, all of these scores up here, there's, there's nothing like that going on in the group that was bound, if you will, or, or destined to relapse. So these are things that, we, that help us, again, think about what these treatments do and how we might apply that kind of thinking uh, in the future. Um, we have some new evidence about the effects of antidepressant medications. So one of the, one of the things that's happened, um, because of the way uh, investigations of medicines are structured, they're, they're, uh, ph pharmaceutical companies have a particular interest in, as they should, in uh, doing the research that moves their uh, uh, promising medications to approval by the FDA. But in the process, uh, many kind of questions that one might be curious about don't, uh, aren't featured so heavily. And one of them is, what are the other things these antidepressant medications do besides produce some side effects? We know about those and produce drops in depression. And that's Im and important too. Uh, well, it's the most important. But what, what, it, what do they do? These are drugs that affect the brain. What happens when those drugs go into the brain? How do they affect people's experience and their behavior? Well, there is a, those of you who studied psychology in, in college or, or have an interest in it now would, would certainly be uh, uh, familiar with the term neuroticism. It's a, it's a concept that's been around for many, many decades, and, it, and it's meant to portray a dimension on which we vary from the very mellow among us who nothing seems to bother us to those who, if, a, if my Coke were to spill, like when your Coke spilled, you know, I got a little uh, jumpy. Uh, 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 the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 or when you see an envelope that shows up in the mail and it says IRS and the return address, and, uh, and then of course later we open it up, it's a form letter. But um, uh, in the meanwhile, our neuroticism has played out. But notice that I wasn't talking about a depressed person there in any of those cases. I'm just talking about life, people dealing with life in different ways. Well, it turns out neuroticism is a risk factor for depression. There are a lot of, if you're high on neuroticism, you're simply more likely to become depressed later in life. Doesn't mean you will, but you're more likely. Well, look what happened to the neuroticism scores. And these are things that aren't supposed to change. Neuroticism is something you have for your lifetime. This is what happened over eight weeks to, neuro oops, to neuroticism. If you took placebo and 
uh, your neuroticism dropped a little tiny bit. If you took the antidepressant medication, it dropped a lot. Compare that to what happened to depressive symptoms. If you took placebo, as is always the case, your depression dropped quite a bit. If you took medications, it dropped even more. That's a significant difference. But look at how much more potent, if you will, and there, I don't know quite the words to describe this, but how much more potent the medication seemed to be uh, in changing this thing called neuroticism than relative to the thing for which it's marketed and for which we prescribe it. So uh, very intriguing finding, and there's more. So here's what happened to depression during placebo, this, I, I've already shown you that on placebo, depression drops quite a bit. And then those patients, we said, would you like some you know, treatment now? They said yes. And so over the next eight weeks, that's what the SSRIs did to their depression. Here's, for the subgroup that we had data on, here's what the placebo did to neuroticism during the eight weeks. It didn't change it, basically. We put them on SSRIs, boom. So, uh, a very clear demonstration to us, I mean, whether neuroticism is the right name uh, for the thing that we measured, very clear demonstration to us that something is going on that's not being captured by our standard measures of depression and should tell us about brain mechanisms and, and other, in fact, other uses uh, for antidepressants. You might know that antidepressants, when I said they're used more widely than any medication, it's not just for depression. They're used for, well, pretty much anything, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, social phobia, uh, uh, all manner of things, but uh, at any rate, uh, the, there, there do seem to be these clear effects that I, I, I'm dying to know uh, more about uh, with further research. Now, this is the one that no one believes. Uh, in fact, I didn't bring the slide that nobody but me believes. Um, <laughs> uh, and that is, uh, for those patients, now these are all patients who got better with their medicine. Uh, for those patients whose neuroticism changed a lot, we represent that by the top third in change, that's how much they relapsed over the course of the year, not much at all. Though, these are all patients, by the way, this is all corrected for how depressed they were at the end. So these patients were all fine, looked good and everything, but they take our test and, and these people's neuroticism changed hardly at all, okay? They're doing fine, not. That is, they're doing fine for a month or so, they start dropping, 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 and uh, very few of them made it through the year without a relapse. I'm going to tell you about the slide I didn't bring, which is that these figures collapse those who stayed on their medications versus those who didn't, it didn't matter. That is to say, people whose neuroticism changed a lot, but who went off their medication, in our sample, they did just fine, Pe and, and so on. So it, it's an intriguing finding, but again, not something that's been investigated much, uh, uh, well, not investigated at all until, until now. Um, now, there's a, an exciting and promising frontier uh, 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 and, and it's getting a lot of, uh, of attention, a, a, a lot of funding, and, 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 and some pretty good work. Um, and the question is, can we use neuroimaging uh, to guide treatment decisions? So if the brain is where depression starts, or where it resides, or where we can, tr where we can intervene, um, uh, can we use uh, pictures of the brain to help us under understand individuals' particular pathologies and that, that would direct us to, to given treatment uh, versus another? Uh, and then also, and this is one that, oops, uh, that's uh, intriguing to all of us, is might studies of, of changes in the brain over the course of treatment begin to tell us about how these treatments work? The one, one thing I really like about doing this kind of work is we have two treatments that absolutely, obviously, must work in some different way. Now, they may, get, may or may not get to the same endpoint, although they don't seem to get to the same endpoint because in the one you can take it away and the person persists uh, uh, likely doing well and the other one need to stay on the medication. But uh, at any rate, they do seem to get to a common path at the end. And I just want to, I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of data, partly because, or actually no data, uh, because there are no trustworthy data to my mind. They're intriguing bits, but I think for, for this purpose, I'd rather answer questions than show you data that will be shown to have had flaws next week or month. Um, so uh, uh, just to come back really to the beginning of the talk and to say that the investigations center around the communication between the more primitive areas of the brain, uh, such as the amygdala, and the uh, uh, prefrontal lobes. And the idea, again, emotion generating, emotion regulating. And the idea is that uh, both of these systems are suspected, and evidence for this, are uh, uh, pathological in a depressed person. The question is whether, in some patients, is, it, is the problem more the prefrontal lobes and less the 
uh, uh, limbic areas and for others the other way around. It's a little hard to tell that because they do communicate so much for each, with each other. Uh, the prefrontal lobes actually suppress or inhibit uh, or, or don't if they're not doing their job. This. So when, when this goes up, this tends to go down and, and vice versa. So it's hard to, to disentangle that, but, but we're making progress. And so the hypothesis, and, and again, the data are, are, are few and, and not terribly convincing yet, um, is that, uh, but certainly common sense would say that the cognitive therapy or uh, treatment that engages the, the executive functions of the mind would uh, in some ways change or alter or strengthen uh, those areas which would then lead to a suppression of uh, or a controlling of the uh, uh, hyperactivity, if you want, of the limbic structures. And the medicines are believed, although this is, this is even more just conjecture, uh, perhaps to affect more directly the emotion generating centers and, and to have perhaps later on uh, a, a knock-on effect of uh, 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 ramping up or uh, energizing or allowing the frontal lobes to be energized because they wouldn't have been inhibited by the hyperactivity of the, um, pre, uh, the uh, limbic regions. So the idea is that after medications and, and therapy, there, the, these two uh, systems would be more in balance, uh, uh, perhaps uh, getting there in uh, two different ways. We want to test these kinds of ideas. Uh, we think that uh, although this would, oops, although this would be interesting to uh, test ideas about different paths for the effects, probably the more clinically important would be if it's possible to use pretreatment uh, uh, information about the brain to, again, select which is the better treatment or which is the best treatment for a given individual. So anyway, those are things that, uh, that we've worked on. And uh, I'd be glad to take questions about any of it or stuff I didn't talk about. Yes. Can you talk about the efficacy of MAOIs and uh, TMR? Well, I, I can. Now, I'm not a medical doctor, and so uh, I'll, I, I read the literature. Uh, I don't read those literatures as carefully as some others. Uh, the MAOIs, as, as, as I, and my colleague Jay Amsterdam, is, I talk with him a lot about these things, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll just channel him. Uh, the MAOIs are probably as effective, perhaps more effective, than any of the other drug classes. That would be uh, Dr. Amsterdam's opinion. Um, uh, they are, they've, in Europe, they're used quite a lot more. Uh, here they, they got a bad reputation because uh, people couldn't have soy sauce or, or you know, uh, things perhaps even got exaggerated in that regard. Red wine, soy sauce, and other things, cheeses, aged cheeses are, are not good things to have when you're on MAO inhibitors, whereas the other ones don't have those kinds of dietary restrictions. But the MAOIs are not used much at all by anybody anymore in this country, and that's probably a mistake, so, so would say my colleague. Now, uh, you're talking about transcranial uh, uh, magnetic stimulation. Uh, those data, uh, the last time I looked at them, I, I, I wasn't impressed, but I, I'm not an expert on that, and I haven't uh, kept up on that as much. I think there's not been, certainly, uh, uh, I've not heard of or I've not been made aware of uh, convincing evidence that this is the next big thing. But, you know, at, uh, with electroconvulsive therapy, if you think about it, the engineers in the audience uh, uh, imagine how many parameters there would be to titrate the electroconvulsive therapy before it begins to be effective with fewer side effects. That, that work was being developed over decades. And the reputation for its effectiveness or its side effects was m set early on. And so while the, some few people were working a way to make that treatment better and safer, um, the reputation kind of lagged well behind it. So uh, the, uh, the only reason I bring that up is that with transcranial magnetic stimulation, even if it's the case that right now it's not very useful, there's so many ways that, that, that they can go with that in terms of targeting it, different uh, pulses and those kinds of things that I guess it's, you know, we cross our fingers. Is there, I'm going to jump on the follow is there a class B on the SSRIs? Well, the NSRIs, uh, I don't know if it's beyond or, or going back. It's, uh, so the SSRIs were, 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 were spoken about uh, uh, and touted as focusing specifically on serotonin, which was thought to be the culprit. Um, uh, and so they're talked about as clean drugs, uh, which, which uh, because the older drugs have mostly targeted norepinephrine. They were talked about as balanced, but the, some, some ways of looking at those uh, 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 assays would say that it's mostly norepinephrine. And so people moved away from that. Then they moved back to the NSRIs, which is, are now the ones that are currently being marketed. And the, re the reason they're not exactly the same as the old ones is that uh, uh, some of what's been learned from the SSRIs has been employed, as I understand it, in the development of these things, so that uh, some of the kinds of side effects that the older ones brought on aren't uh, being brought on by the NSRIs, which are 
like the old ones. Thank you. Yes. One of the things you talked about earlier was uh, looking strictly at, say, CBT versus you know, all classes of depressants. Uh, but it seems to me that there's various classes of CBT, of behavioral therapy, and there's various classes of SSRIs. Yes. Is there, what's the variation look like when you look at those types of studies? Oh, boy. There's been almost, there's been so little work on variation in anything you'd call psychotherapies. And once you narrow it to CBT, or cognitive therapy, we know very little about what happens when you fiddle around with uh, the parameters there. Uh, but the lesson from the antidepressant medications is that, um, again, most of these treatments are about equally as effective as each other. There are some data that come out from time to time that show some subtle uh, advantages for one drug or another, but of course there are so many of them that the drugs that are seen in those analyses to be a bit weaker pretty much, you know, are, are set off to the side. And so you end up, again, well, with a dozen or two dozen, uh, uh, let's say a dozen medications that, as far as we know, are about equally as effective. And it's, again, it's more a matter of side effects and the like that, that, that distinguishes them. Yes? Is, is it still the case to say accurately that a, any given patient may get started on one antidepressive drug and or don't seem to be doing anything, so they switch and they try something else, and the, is it still this fine tuning of... A excellent question. And certainly in, in clinical practice, this is what is done. And it makes perfect sense that if something doesn't, doesn't work, you shift to something else. And in typical clinical practice, that means you start with an antidepressant medication, and if that's not working, you shift to another antidepressant medication, maybe you add one. And what the problem is there in regard to research, there's all, there hasn't been a way to investigate whether that, as a practice, is superior to continuing on with the medicine that wasn't working. Because what's happened? More time has passed, right? And so uh, very few studies have, have, actu uh, have actually looked at the comparison between switching after failure of, of an antidepressant medication versus persisting. What we know is that the longer you treat someone who isn't responding, the more likely it is that they'll switch into the response category. But of course, that will happen with the passage of time anyway. You can, since they can't flip the other way, there's no, you know, they're already depressed. They can only stay that way or get better. Uh, and so the question is, is uh, can we test for whether the switching idea is, is, is superior to persisting. And that's been very, very tricky. And so, for example, in the JAMA article that uh, Joan referenced, uh, um, uh, we, we don't say a thing about any uh, 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 effects that go beyond six or eight weeks. Our paper is clearly about the kind of tests that are done uh, to get pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceuticals approved. It's the, the vast literature on the six to eight week treatments compared to placebo. And we simply looked for the first time at a, at a, at the, a group that hadn't been studied, namely the people with mild, moderate, and what are called severe depression, but I, I, I would call them moderate. Um, so uh, uh, there's just so little that's known about uh, what happens as things go along. So when I got, when there was this publicity over this JAM article, I was, uh, you know, I wanted to hear what people had to say. So I did a couple talk shows, and, or, you know, call in shows and things. And people would be quite convinced. They'd say, but this can't be true. You know, your, your, your evidence isn't relevant to my patients I'd get from psychiatrists and the radio because. Um, I will give them a medicine, and then I'll switch it, and that's what gets them better. And I'm thinking, well, maybe that's what got them better, but maybe it was whatever, you know, the placebo response. I mean, our data don't say one way or the other, but certainly clinical experience can only take us so far in sorting out these kinds of causal issues. But uh, certainly the practice is this. Yes. Yeah. Could you just say a word about what cognitive behavior therapy Ah, okay. So cognitive behavior therapy or cognitive therapy, it, it can be referenced either way, um, is a, a treatment that focuses very much on uh, uh, teaching the depressed patient to pay attention to those voices, and we don't talk about them as voices, but those, those things that we say to ourselves, those inferences, judgments, predictions that we make, we do them all the time. You, you, those, many of you know what I mean. The rest of you can keep, keep an eye on your mind as you leave today. That we're making all kinds of predictions about uh, judgments, so-and-so doesn't like me, I'll never get a job, this, and so on. And these are statements that we make to ourselves that uh, when we make them, as with Abe, Abe Lincoln, Right? Uh, I mean, if he would have elaborated, he would have told us exactly why it was that uh, he was sad. It was because he knew he would never succeed, and so on and so forth. Well, we, we know that Abe did pretty well. Uh, so he, he made judgments that were incorrect, that were biased and incorrect. Uh, if he had a cognitive therapist, the cognitive therapist would have asked him to pay attention to those, to uh, figure out ways to test them out. How would you know 
if you're, you're simply not suited for uh, success in public life? What would you look, you know, if you really wanted to test this out, what would you do? And so uh, uh, you get people to test their ideas, get them essentially to get enough distance from them so that they can test them because when we have them, and many of you know what I'm talking about, it certainly happens to me from time to time, we get wrapped up and we're convinced of something. Well, we're convinced of it because we, we're not seeing it objectively. So they look at it objectively. They learn to do this as part of their lives. And that's the key. It's, it sounds simple, and it is in a way simple. For a depressed person, it's very difficult. But they need to, to learn to do it if they're going to use this therapy. Uh, they need to learn to do it as a part of their life. They need to be on the lookout for these things. So that's roughly what it is. It has some other elements, get, getting people activated, uh, getting them to understand what the barrier is to their applying for the job. It's up here, but they've got to go and do the application in order for, for that work to uh, help. Yes? Are there data showing the efficacy or otherwise of a dual treatment, someone taking medication and therapy, either interpersonal or Yes, there are data around. We're actually uh, conducting a, tr a large trial of that ourselves now, and we've been a bit surprised by what we're finding. Um, it, certainly in the anxiety disorders, the general finding has been that the two don't mix very well, very often. That is to say, a person who's taking an anxiety medication, which is typically an antidepressant, uh, uh, is, is not as likely to gain from the, uh, tr the behavioral treatments that are given there. Uh, there's, and we can talk about why that might be, but that's a pretty consistent finding. It was believed that the, that, that wasn't true in depression, that these things are additive in some way. They may be additive, but it also may t depend on the medication. Uh, but they're not hugely additive. That is to say, you, the, the boost that you get from the second treatment doesn't get you much better response than the individual one. In our current trial, we're getting a very little uh, evidence of a boost. We haven't published these data yet. And we're witnessing, maybe because of the medicine that we're using, that the patients aren't engaging in the treatment. They're, uh, or, you know, partly our design of our trials said, we're going to keep treating you until you get better and you all get medications. And so, you know, the patients are maybe, we're, we're going to do some analyses of tapes of this, uh, uh, maybe saying, well, you know, I'll just wait around. Why do I need to do all this work? Because the doctor said that this medicine will probably make me get better. And if it doesn't, I'll be switched to another one. And so that one will work, and so on and so forth. So we, it turns out that the advantage of the cognitive ther adding cognitive therapy in our new trial looks like it emerges quite late. Uh, and we're going to be looking to see if there's just a lot of, how to, I don't want to say laziness, a lot of uh, l uh, lack of engagement in the, or even resistance in the beginning. Yes? Yeah, and if I read the slides correctly, it looks like fluoroxetine decreased neuroticism sort of over the long term, even when the compound was consumed. Well, OK, so those, were, those are two okay. kinds of slides. Yeah. Is, to whatever extent that's true, I didn't notice that there was a marked effect like that with um, personality disorder. And I also have no idea what's the difference between personality disorder. Yeah, we're still trying to understand all of that. So you're asking us a question that we're now asking ourselves. We have not put those two kinds of data together. They're, they're not exactly in line, and they're not uh, orthogonal. They're, they, we've got to figure out how to, how to get those ideas together. They're both clear effects in our data, just as you saw, but we don't know how they participate together. Yes, and is there some time at which I should be uh, uh, saying something about that? Uh, is there some time at which uh, people sort of generally leave? I'm happy to stay all afternoon, but uh, I, I know other people have uh, things they need to go to. I, I think we should probably wrap it up now, and if anybody wanted to stay and ask a question, they could. Um, the fundamental question is to whether or not this region is broken out by women versus men, since women have twice as much depression as men, and your response will relapse rate. Right? Yes, uh, we've, we look at that variable every time, and we never have found anything, uh, uh, particularly in regard to the findings I've shown you. Uh, the response rates are the same, and so on and so on. Uh, we just don't get a difference. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Derubis. He may be willing to stay here a little bit and answer some other questions. <laughs> I also just wanted to note that a lot of his work was funded by the National Institutes of Health, and, um, and that funding is very important to um, scientific progress in general. And I look forward to seeing you at the next caucus. I think the schedule is outside on the table. Thank you.